more of them throughout this presentation. We all need to make sure that we can hear. The purpose of this today is to ensure that we hear less from me about the benefits of the, the extra benefits of the community ministry in Canada and hear more from your peers working at various studios, all the way from St. John's Newfoundland to Vancouver, British Columbia, and all parts of the world. The whole entire purpose of this year is to research campaigns to humanize the video game industry, to make people understand this. People who are making the games are really very talented, special people, but also a lot just like anybody else. They're not people who are in the back rooms making games that are designed to win. They're actually regular people who are doing things because they're extremely passionate about understand what our industry is contributing, what we bring to the table. I just want to thank each and every one of my members, those of you who are here today, thank you for your support, uh, and those of you who are not uh, every day, whether you're here or not, we appreciate the support that you provide us. So what do we do? Well, we work on issues, really difficult situations and, and, and issues, both all, all federally, provincially, and globally. Some of the difficult things we're working on and we have been working on for the last couple of years are things like the WHO's gaming disorder, addiction, loot boxes, violence and its portrayal in the media, tax credits which are so important to the video game industry, especially here in Quebec, privacy regulations which are becoming more and more complex, especially given the GDPR regulations that came into effect in Europe uh, about a year and a half ago and the government's uh, current position on its digital charter which will likely adopt similar privacy regulations and for all of us who make online games and collect even the littlest bit of data that becomes even more and more important as we move into the future and talented immigration where would we be without people to make the games and today that's about what this presentation really is designed to showcase is about the talent in the video game industry the people who are making the games that we love to play that we love to celebrate but also who they are, where they come from, and what our industry means to the five cities that we have profiled today. We're working very closely with government in Ottawa on a regular basis. We host a parliamentary day every February, which we'll be planning very shortly. Uh, and I, I uh, would like to thank those from the federal government who are here today who have shown us their support in the past. You can see last year we had Minister Baines, the Minister of Innovation, Science and Economic Development, who came and spoke at our event. I would like to thank Member of Parliament Sean Casey, who's in the audience today, who has gladly sponsored our event in the past. And you can see that it attracts a lot of parliamentarians and their staff. It is a primary way that we are able to convey the benefits and positive impacts the video game industry is making on the Canadian economy. We're also working very closely with students. In fact, I would like to point out uh, a winning student team from the U University of Quebec, Abitibi Timiskaming, and the University of Quebec of Montreal, who won our E3 student video game competition just this year. You can see them in the bottom right with myself and the CEO of ESA in the US who runs E3. We paid and sent this, this student team to Los Angeles for a few days to showcase their game on the show floor next to some of the biggest publishers and developers in the world. 
And in addition, we are pleased to announce that we just partnered with the Information and Communications Technology Council on a way uh, work integrated learning program, which is a, a subsidized program funded by the federal government that incents companies to increase the number of co-ops and interns that they hire. So whatever we can do to help keep driving the talent and incent students to be able to get out into the industry with the skills that they need is very important to us. But I'm going to go back to some of the difficult issues that we've had to deal with this year. Because it has been a tough year for us, my team, and all of us who are working on policy and media around the world. These are just Canadian headlines. Some difficult things. Is there a link between video games and violence? Quebec looks to combat huge rise in cyber addiction among youth. Experts are weighing in on the intersection of violence and video. It's not just in Canada. It's all over the world. What used to be an industry that got great headlines because of the jobs that it created, because of the player experiences that we created, has been relegated to an, an untenable and unheard of position with negative media stereotypes and tropes that position our industry as something other than the positive benefit that it is. And that is what we are working to change. But it is not all bad. And our industry has been working globally with each other as tight as we have ever worked before. And in fact, two weeks from today, my team and I leave for Brussels, Belgium to the Global Association Summit, where we will be meeting with our colleagues from all over the world to ensure that our industry is positioned in a unilateral and targeted basis on all of these difficult issues that we're facing. We have met with the World Health Organization. We have had a summit with them. We have voiced our displeasure about their position and their assertions about our industry. And we continue to work with them. In fact, we have a call again tomorrow morning to talk about what our next steps are. But again, it's not all bad. We've had a lot of positive media. Our job, and, and, and I must say the collective job of our industry, is to ensure that policymakers and media, parents, and those who are in the public understand that our industry is a force for good, both for players and also for the economy. And today I'm going to unveil some amazing statistics that are going to show how good and how, how big our industry is growing and what it actually means for jobs and the economy, which is one of the most important political and policy files that the new government will be focusing on when they come back and which we need to ensure they understand how we play a role. I lived in Vancouver for 17 years. I went to UBC and then stayed in Vancouver. Um, at that point and started my career there. After having our first child, we decided to move to Edmonton and it was really by chance that I ended up at EA. I was working for another company in another industry and uh, was looking for work somewhere that was stable and uh, a larger company. Eight years later, we're still living in Edmonton. I am based in Edmonton, however, all the teams I work with are across the globe, so I'm working remotely. We have groups in Vancouver, in Orlando, Florida, San Francisco, and then in Europe, Gothenburg, Sweden, and Guildford in the UK. We also partner very closely with our sister studio in Shanghai. Edmonton has definitely come a long way. I've been here for going on eight years, like I said, and when I first started, it was really BioWare and a few really small independent startups. You know, BioWare continues to operate as BioWare and make their games like Dragon Age and Mass Effect and most recently Anthem, um, but they work as part of the EA family. I visit my teams a lot. I go back to Vancouver, I go to Orlando regularly, I visit Europe regularly. We're a family of creative teams, so we have art, we have audio, we have rigging, facial animation, technical art, we have some tools and tech groups as part of our organization, the Capture Lab. Um, my group in particular is EA Create Art. We create all the visual experiences in the games. We have lighters and character artists, worlds artists, technical artists and managers. All of the worlds and the characters and the vehicles, all of that coming together is what we create. My role is really about 
um, running the business, bringing those groups together to work as one team, and to create our art in the most efficient way possible while always pushing quality and moving quality forward. It's a true partnership between the development team and us, and we deliver that visual experience. It's an exciting and relevant industry for anyone to be a part of, especially given all the spin-offs. Like, I really believe that, you know, people think of gaming and they think of a very specific um, career, but there's so many industries using gaming now, and I think gaming as an industry hasn't exploded yet. I think we're, we're right on that brink now with cloud gaming and streaming and, um, you know, machine learning, AI, all of these n newer industries. I think we're at the brink of our explosion. For the Canadian economy, we're well positioned to be a really big contributor to that in the next 10 to 20 years for sure. Everybody plays games, we need everybody making games. My name is Tanya Poulter, I work with EA and we're advancing the industry and growing the game. Can you hear me? And this video is one of my favorite because it's the first time we profiled Edmonton and there was a amazing renaissance happening in Alberta since the introduction of the interactive digital media tax credit last year. And in fact, we just had to edit this video last week because the government decided to kill the tax credit in Alberta. A lot of the benefits that were coming from this were because of the support that the government showed our industry. Companies were setting up, jobs were being created, and momentum was on the roll. But now, I honestly don't know where the industry is, and I'm sure it will survive and will thrive, but it's a massive disappointment for them. And I know that when we went to Edmonton and we profiled Tanya, we profiled what the impact means for the city of Edmonton and the province of Alberta, it was clear that there was a huge passion out there and that the government does need to look at other types of uh, industries for diversification in Alberta. But digressing, this is the number that's most important to us today. $4.5 billion our industry contributes to the federal government, uh, the Canadian economy each year. Sorry, not to the federal government, but to the Canadian economy. That is a massive increase from the $3.7 billion that we contributed just two years ago. It shows that our industry is growing, that it's becoming more important, and it gives us a platform to have a stronger voice to advocate on things that are important for our industry to move forward. Studios are growing. We've got a 16% increase in studios over the last two years. 692, almost 700 studios. You know, it actually sounds like a lot, but when you think about what the United States has, thousands, even the United Kingdom with just double the population of ours and only about 12, 13,000 full-time employees, they have roughly 2,000 video game studios. We have 700, but we have so many more titles, we have so many more franchises being developed here, and so many more people working in the industry. And we've got three behemoths in our country. 82% of the studios, those 700, are based in three provinces, Ontario, Quebec, and British Columbia. Probably no surprise to the, those of you who are here. And you can get an idea of how many studios we've been able to find in each one. 218 studios here in Quebec another 235 in Ontario, and 118, 116 in British Columbia, with 86 in the Prairies, and roughly 40, 38 in Atlantic Canada. This is the first year we've been able to quantify at least some data for the West, outside of British Columbia, and also break down Atlantic Canada, which has a thriving video game industry, and I'm heading to Halifax tonight, where I'm from, and I'm very excited about that. So to give you an idea, of the size of the different studios that are in each province. Obviously, Ontario, for the last, I've been in this job seven years, for the last seven years at least, Ontario's always had the most studios, but they've always had the most micro studios. It's an industry of fewer behemoths and many more independents, many more startups, but Quebec is now right behind. Used to be that Ontario had so many more startups than Quebec had. Quebec had all the big players, all the big publishers. But now, that momentum that, the, that those big companies have created has now spurred off into the creation of so many independent studios in Quebec, and the, the momentum here is, is just booming. And then you see what we have in British Columbia. We have 
a, a, a mix between standard and micro, uh, and then uh, you know almost 10 of the large publishers. It's, it's still very much an industry that has many large publishers. And in the rest of Canada, there are about four large publisher developers, uh, over 100 people who uh, are outside of these various provinces. I'm going to introduce you to another one of your peers from across the country. I grew up playing games like I, I played games before I could even read. I grew up in Vancouver and ended up moving to Ontario to go to university. And I went to the University of Waterloo to study engineering. I didn't start initially in the video game industry when I graduated. I actually started working um, more in the visual effects industry. So I moved to LA to be close to Hollywood. Um, and I was working on software, I was writing software for digital compositing, blue screen type compositing and, and visual effects. I was really trying to find a place where I could take my technical skills as an engineer and as a programmer and apply them in content creation. So I was a video game producer for most of my career um, up until this point. And then just in the last year, I decided to uh, branch into corporate affairs and, and to, instead of focusing just on producing video games, um, what I found appealing about corporate affairs is having a real impact on just how the industry is going to develop over time. So when I first joined Ubisoft Toronto, I was actually in Montreal because the building didn't exist yet. I started as employee number five back in 2010. Today we're 2019 and we're over 800 people. We developed our teams, we grew our teams to really find the right talent to be able to make AAA games. And we've been really fortunate in that we found a lot of talent right here in Ontario. The corporate affairs team was created a few years ago. What we do is we work with our government, educational and institutional partners and industry partners as well um, to see what we can do to participate and help develop that ecosystem. The video game industry is constantly changing. It's, it, it can't stand still because technology is always changing. Culture is always changing. People care about different things. People want to consume different things. People want to get engaged with, with, with new ideas. So growing the game to me is about growing the industry. And what's amazing about the video game industry is we employ and work with talent from all different types of crafts, all types of different backgrounds. And it's a collaborative environment as well. I'm Leslie Ford Toy from Ubisoft and we're advancing the industry and growing the game. And Leslie's great. I mean, Ubisoft Toronto, uh, obviously everybody here from, from Quebec and from Montreal knows the success of Ubisoft in, in this province, but Ubisoft in Toronto started as five people and is now 800 after nine years. I mean, it is a phenomenal story that we want to highlight. And when I'm talking about jobs, 48,000 jobs. That's what our industry contributes, both direct and indirect. 48,000, almost 50,000 jobs across Canada our industry supports. Almost 28,000 are directly employed with our companies. That is a 28% increase over two years ago. When you think about what the Canadian economy has been growing with respect to job growth, over the last two years we've been averaging about 1.2% per year. We're averaging about 14%. So at 10 times the job growth our industry has contributed versus all of the other industries in Canada at the exact same time. Typically, it is much more. Our industry continues to grow faster than the Canadian economy, faster than job growth across Canada. But this year, it's grown over the last two years, I should say, exceptionally fast. 83% of those jobs are uh, full-time permanent, with about 17 of them permanent contract. So we were able to break that out as well. Regardless, all these people are working uh, full-time. And where is this breakdown? For those of you, I guess since we're in Quebec today, you'd be proud to know that almost half of the industry's employment in this country is based right here in this province. 13,000 full-time jobs, which is an increase from about 10,000 two years ago. Now, our 2015 study showed us that Quebec had about 11,000 jobs. 2017, there was a bit of a blip with 10,000, and now we're back up to 13,000. But the key message that I could leave anybody uh, in Quebec that's watching is that if they think that this industry is done growing in this province, you are wrong. 
20 years this industry has been growing in this province, and we're still adding 3,000 jobs over two years. It is a testament to the policy decisions that the Quebec government made 20 years ago, and that those policy decisions are continuing to pay dividends today. Second most populous province with respect to jobs is British Columbia, the oldest industry in our country. Then Ontario at 5,000, and 2,200 across the rest of the country with about 1,250 in Atlantic Canada over the four provinces, and 1,230 in the prairies with the vast majority of that coming from Alberta and some from Manitoba. But I, let's just say that our industry is not, even though it is centered in Quebec, it is very much a national industry. An interesting stat here is that of all of those 27,700 jobs, almost 80% of them are in companies that employ over 100 people. Only 21% of the industry is in the smaller micro to standard size companies. So there is a bit of an imbalance that doesn't really surprise me. It's always been like this. The smaller companies, fewer people focused on bootstrapping their ideas, getting their IP out to market. They're not focused on the, the, the job growth that it, with respect to what some of the larger companies need, but it is an interesting stat uh, nonetheless. The average salary, about twice the Canadian average at $76,000. Our industry is contributing not only 28,000 direct jobs in this country, but 28,000 jobs that pay on average of $76,000. I would challenge anyone to know of another industry outside of uh, the technology industry that is creating those types of job numbers at that level of salary. And with that, the fourth of our fifth videos. <coughs> So Kabam is actually my first role in the video game industry. Um, I started at Kabam about two years ago. My prior roles before Kabam were in direct marketing. I worked for a direct marketing company in uh, Japan that specialized in infomercials and then also branched into e-commerce. After that, when I came back to Canada, I, um, my career was in telecommunications in the mobility business. And so I think both of those experiences taught me a lot and gave me knowledge that was applicable to the um, mobile game industry. The role of business intelligence within Kabam is to act as another analytical team that conducts analysis external and internally within the company. So within Kabam, we have three teams that conduct analysis. We have a data science team, we have the business intelligence team, and we have uh, FP&A, financial planning and analysis. Where my business intelligence team sits is kind of between the two of them. We provide data analytics at a macro level. So we have technical skills, but we also have business acumen within the team. We also have uh, research and kind of academic backgrounds within the team. And so through that, we're looking for information that can help drive the strategy and support the decisions that the company has to make. So we are looking both internally at our game data we're looking at our financial data as well, and we also look externally. So we are looking and sizing markets throughout the world. We are identifying opportunities in new markets and testing, you know, if we want to go into a new market, what is the size of that opportunity? What could we hope for in terms of our results? You look at global markets, right? You know, as far as Vancouver goes, in terms of developers and companies that are making the games, it is certainly an industry that's growing in Vancouver. In fact, the whole tech industry is growing. In fact, I would say video games are taking the lead in the growth. I think the keys to Canadian success in the uh, video game industry is looking at uh, the markets. So um, one of the largest markets for video games is the United States. Well, what Canada has to its benefit is that culturally, we are very similar to the largest video game market in the Western world. We still share similarities to Western Europe, another very large, wealthy market. We can attract talent. We have homebred talent here, especially in Vancouver. We've got a number of institutions that can produce very highly skilled uh, technical workers. Uh, because these are highly skilled workers earning strong salaries, they're able to get Canadian visas. They meet the requirements for Canadian visas. And so therefore, we're not limited just to the pool of workers here in Canada, but we can attract and be attractive to workers throughout the world. We have 
um, cost advantages here. This is largely supported by the government with the tax credits that they give for technical roles, including the video game industry. So as long as we can compete and be competitive for the cost of labor and the cost of production, we are going to be an attractive location for many uh, game developers. What is the most well-known Canadian mobile developer? It's us, and we want to become as big as Supercell, and as big as Machine Zone, and as big as EA. My name is Sven Tapp, and at Kabam, we are advancing the industry and growing the game. You know, and Kabam and Sven are a great testament to what we've got going on in Vancouver. You know, a company that wasn't even there uh, five years ago, now employing, you know, upwards of 250 people and just driving some of the most uh, well-known mobile titles in all the world with their contest of champions. And it's a, it's a great story. Sven is also uh, a great intro into the demographics of our industry. I, I, I can't tell you the number of times I do media interviews and people ask me if our industry is driven by kids in basements with computers writing code. And I, I always have to be respectful when I answer that question, but I always do, do kind of chuckle a bit because the average age in our industry is 31 years old. We are a maturing industry. Uh, and we've got different demographics across the country that you'll see. So for instance, here in Quebec, actually the youngest demographic in all of Canada with respect to the average age of workers. And that really doesn't surprise me because it is the biggest industry in the country and the amount of junior talent that companies in Quebec are hiring straight out of schools and working with co-ops and interns, uh, I'm sure is the reason that that is driving that. When we look in Ontario, we're seeing a, a higher age also doing very well, as you heard Leslie Ford Toy talk about with respect to Ubisoft and others working with the various institutions in Ontario. But it is a, a, a different industry. It's a, a lot more entrepreneurial with respect to a lot of the smaller studios. The people that start those studios are often a little older when they start them, not really surprising at all. And then, of course, the oldest in, in, in uh, British Columbia in Vancouver, which also doesn't surprise me because it was the first video game industry in this country, and a lot of the people who are working there are legacy employees that have been there since the 90s, who are now running studios, who are now leading projects, uh, and it's a bit of a, a different industry. We have 35 years. Uh, in Atlantic Canada, which again, being from there, doesn't surprise me. Atlantic Canada, at least when I was working for the Nova Scotia government, was doing really good work by attracting uh, people my age who wanted to move back to a, a place where they were either from or their spouse was from or partner, where they could have a slower pace of life in a sense and, and, and raise, uh, raise their kids. That was very much the target uh, employee for us when we were attracting those people. And it, it doesn't surprise me that the age is that. And then in the prairies, the average age is 32. So Quebec is by far the youngest industry uh, in our country. Uh, and that is, I believe, because of its size and its uh, amazing connections between the studios and the various institutions. Take University of Quebec, Abitibi, Temiskaming, which I mentioned earlier. The last three years of our E3 student video game competition has been won by a school in Quebec. Two years in a row it's been won by schools from Abitibi to Miskaming. So something right is happening in Quebec with respect to uh, the development of talent and obviously we really like to see that. The last section we're going to deal with before I, I'll let you go is women in games. Something that we started measuring in 2015. We have a 19% of, uh, of the industry uh, this year is made up of, of women. It's an, it's an increase of 3%. It's a small increase. Uh, I, don't hire, I don't hire people. Um, you know, it is something that I think our industry needs to continue to focus on, needs to be uh, cognizant of. And, uh, and needs to continue to quantify. It's something that uh, the tech industry across the world and across Canada needs to ensure they're, they're working on. And I can give you a, a breakdown of uh, what it's like in the various different regions. Uh, so the red is the percent of employees who identify as women, and the gray is the percent of women directly working on games. So you can see that 
you know, in Atlantic, it's the highest percentage of women who are directly working on games, likely because there's some smaller companies. They get their hands more able to get uh, uh, on the games. Um, but it could be other decisions that, that companies make. But uh, I was proud to see that. But it's, it's pretty similar. You know, the average across Canada is 52% women working directly on games. Uh, and then here in Quebec, it's 56. And in Ontario, it's 56, both above the national average. So on that, I'm going to leave you with one more video to listen to one more of your peers before I'll take some questions. And uh, I hope that you've enjoyed today's uh, talk. I apologize for the technical difficulties to get us started. We spent a lot of work and time building this presentation, so I wanted to make sure you had sound. Um, but we really do believe that it's important to humanize the industry, to ensure that people see those people who are making the games, that it is an industry in Canada that's not only contributing to the economy, but the people who are contributing to that are so different from so many different backgrounds, from so many different walks of life, with such different skill sets. We had a data analyst, we had uh, AI machine learning, we had a corporate strategist slash producer, um, and uh, we had, uh, we have another a guy who's a, a producer and music developer. So, this was what this campaign is about. It's about advancing the industry and growing the game, but it's about ensuring that we humanize the industry for policymakers and media to understand that it is people who are making these games, these experience, and these people care very much about what they do. I've been a long life gamer. I moved to Canada in 2008. In 2009, I actually had an opportunity to join Other Ocean Interactive. I'm originally from Mexico City. I grew up there, and then once I turned 18, I moved to California. One of the things that I actually, that drew me into the industry is the fact that as I was growing up in Mexico, um, video games was something that brought me closer to my cousins, for example, playing games, talk about the experiences that we had and all that. To me, video games have an actual, it's an actual form of expression and creativity. I actually started in the video game industry in California um, on, with a company called LucasArts. I started as an actual tester with them and uh, moved my way up to a lead tester. We ended up making a decision to move to Canada in 2008. We have a team of about 20 to 30 people here in Newfoundland, but we also have studios in PEI, Prince Edward Island, and in California. Between the studio here in Newfoundland and the PEI studio, um, we are comprised of around between 70 and 100 people. Here in Other Ocean alone, we have a diverse team from different parts of the world. Uh, myself from Mexico City, for example, we've had people from Asia, we have people from Europe. Governments across the entire world need to start looking at the video game industry as something that is an incredibly viable way of creating a better economy. I am essentially a producer. What a producer does is they make sure that they, uh, the projects that they handle, that they produce, are being made with high quality, proper standards, and on budget. There's five main disciplines in the development process. So we have uh, programming, we have art, we have design, we have uh, quality assurance and production. Production is unique in that um it's the only discipline that actually interacts with all the other disciplines in order to bring them together and help communication among them. Project Winter has been our most successful game to date, at least here in the Canadian studios. Uh, but also we've had entries in the VR world. For example, Giant Cop, a VR program that allows you to be a giant cop in a tiny city. In Canada, for example, we have tax breaks, you know, multiple different other programs, but definitely something, we, we do have support from the government here, which is great. You know, in, from immigration to actual funding, it's, uh, you know, it's great to see that the country cares. Growth in the video game industry is dynamic. Um, studios have to be uh, adaptable to the needs of the, the industry, essentially, and the needs of their, their um, provinces, provinces and countries. For Other Ocean, that's no different. Other Ocean has actually grown exponentially since we started in 2008. It's in its infancy. I think we started in a good path for the last 10 years again with Other Ocean, um, I think being one of the pioneers in this province. After us, you know, of course there's other studios that have opened up uh, or that have grown in the, in the time since, but it's definitely something that's still growing in this province. My name is Chris Navarro and I work with Other Ocean Interactive. We are advancing the industry and growing the game. Hey, so can you hear me? So that's it. Uh, 
I hope you've enjoyed it. I kind of closed it out before the last video. So um, I'm willing to take questions now. Anything you've got to ask about the, the research. Uh, and, and Corinne will bring the microphone around to you. Hi. Uh, Okay, can you have to switch the sound? Hello, sir? Yeah. Okay, all right, cool. Uh, hi, my name is Hamraj. Uh, I just wanted to ask, uh, you mentioned uh, pretty early in your presentation. Hello, sir? Okay, all right, I'll keep it right next to my mouth. Uh, <laughs> You mentioned earlier uh, in your presentation that you guys, uh, along with you know dealing with Canadian issues and uh, provincial issues in in the industry, you also tackle global issues. And um, I don't know if you've heard of this show called Patriot Act on uh, Netflix by Hasan Minaj. And there was one episode that tackled the big issue of you know uh, worker mistreatment uh, in the video game industry and I was just really curious to uh, on your sense uh, as Canada's gaming association what we're doing in trying to help on that and you know unionize for these workers and give them these fair rights Hey, can you can you hear me? So I haven't seen that episode myself, uh, but obviously I've read all of the, the the media articles that have been. This is this goes on and off. Eh? Okay, so I've read all the media articles and I'm aware of the of the of the issue. And it's not something that's new. It's been going on for a, a number of years with respect to the unionization argument. And and I think that you know, given who we represent and given the the, the companies that uh, that we work for. My position on this is is such that I think every company has its own decisions to make when it comes to to business. Obviously, we we support fair and equal worker rights. I mean, that's it's that's that's goes without saying. I think for us, it, it and I, I've never actually seen any examples of the companies that we represent that there's been any types of issues like this. And I think that. Our position needs to be such that it is to allow the companies to make their own decisions. Obviously, we encourage our companies to uh, ensure that that they're doing things such as, you know, being more diverse with their workforce or uh, ensuring that they're doing enough to to battle uh, narratives around, you know, the, the the online gaming disorder and other things like that. This would be one issue that would be similar to to violence and things like where we we need to get in front of it. We need to deal with it, um, but I wouldn't make a specific position on, on that. With respect to unionization, the, oh, okay, the, the economics guy in me tells me that our industry is not necessarily uh, suited for, for unionization with respect to the way that it, it's a creative industry, right? And every time that you put standards with respect to, you know, hours or this and that, you, you end up kind of taking away some creativity. And I think that our industry thrives because of its, of its openness and its ability for people to, to, to work when they want and how they want um, within what is, you know, right. And um, I think that would be my statement on that with respect to, to that. But it, it would be an individual company. Hi, can you hear me? 
Uh, my name is Jacqueline. I'm from uh, Innovation Science and Economic Development Canada. Um, I actually work in ecosystem mapping, currently in the gaming industry. And uh, I was wondering with your data, we're kind of coming up with our own sort of metrics. Did you find that a lot, I know you were at 596, I believe, firms in the 2017 data. Did you find in this new number that it was a lot of holdovers from the previous data or that it was kind of a boom of new firms particularly? And then I was also curious, one thing we've come up against is that a lot of micro firms, because they do tend to be almost a cottage industry for a lot of people, they have a full-time job, but on the weekends they get together with friends and they develop games, um, that their activity can be very sporadic. So were there any metrics you used to determine whether firms, their companies that were responding, have in fact put out content or are regularly active within the industry? So those are all good questions. It is a challenge to be able to map uh, this. It always has been, and I mean, Christian can respond to this a bit if he wants uh, from Nordicity, but we do this a very similar way that our peers around the world do this, which is uh, we have the list that we have from the last two years and the two years before that. And we want to make sure that those companies are still in business. So first they have to have a website that doesn't bounce. They have to have emails that don't bounce. Uh, and they need to have some sort of online presence. Second, what we do is we really go online and we do weeks worth of checking things like CMF, things like tax credits, uh, other uh, trade missions to GDC, trade missions to Gamescom, anything that uh, the Trade Commissioner Service does. I mean, any place that we can find lists of video game companies that give us an idea of which companies are actually active, which ones are new, which ones we haven't captured in the past, and which ones, you know, have died. Um, so we did. We 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 cut off probably what 50, 60 companies from the 2017 list, and we still grew by you know 100 studios. So. It, it, it's not an exact science. Everything else in this study, I'm, I'll speak for Christian, but everything else is an exact science. It's actually based on 182 surveys. This is not. This is, this is drilling and diving and doing your best to, to figure it out because there is no central database for this. So, but we, we try to make it as, as database as possible, uh, and I think we do a pretty good job at it. Any more questions? Do we have any more questions? Yeah, hi, thanks for the uh, presentation despite all the difficulties you've had today, but uh, uh, I'm just sort of curious to get a sense of, um, you know, we're talking about like uh, average salaries at 75k or 4.5 billion in revenue uh, over the year, but we get a lot of uh, quote-unquote special treatment, you might say, with subsidies or tax credits, and I guess my question is, uh, could we get some visibility on where that return uh, by contrast to the numbers that, you know, the government puts into the industry to promote it and cultivate it, and then what their return is economically on that. So in our 2013 study, we actually had Nordicity quantify the return by looking at the data that the government's published with respect to the spending. So we were able to, to, to do a comparison based on what the revenues and what the, the, um, uh, the inputs were. So we wanted to find out what the outputs were from the government. Um, the, the challenge with doing that is that no matter how bi unbiased it is and how much it's based in actual real data, when you give government numbers and you tell them this is the way it is, especially when it's based on their data, they will often look at you and say, okay, that's great, but you know, finance has its own data and this is what it says so it's we don't really trust us so we st we stopped doing that uh, I can tell you that back in 2013 that the uh, outputs from the tax incentives in Quebec were positive the outcomes uh, in BC were very positive because it is a lower credit and the outcomes in Ontario were about break even because it was a little bit more but in in all of that you're generating not only the fiscal ROI but you're also building that uh, critical mass of talent that you now need to be able to continue to grow other industries it's not just 
just about the money. Like here in Quebec, you're seeing AI explode, you're seeing other industries explode, autonomous vehicles. That's being driven by talent that's already in the city from the video game industry and other industries. So when you're supporting core uh, industries like ours with respect to skill sets that are completely transferable into other industries, you have to look outside of the return. I'm not saying that they're losing money, that's not what I'm saying at all. But I'm saying that there is a return, it is positive, but when I look at it, I look at it from more qualitative sides, not just the quantitative side, and that is exceptionally positive. So uh, Christian wanted to add in, no, you, okay, I did okay, okay, yeah. All right. Last question? Anyone want to ask a question? Raise your hand. <laughs> All right, well, that concludes, oh, we have one more? Okay. Uh, do you have any idea of the forecast? For the yeah. Do you have any forecast for the future? Let's say uh, in the numbers you have provided us, uh, you say there's something about 2019, but do you have any forecast for the future in the industry? If it's still growing like it has grown now? So she asked if I had any forecast into the future with respect to uh, growth of jobs and companies and things like that. Um, this year, we, we have done that in the past with Nordicity, but we opted out of doing that this year, uh, and we put that money into some of the videos and the social media content and things that we're going to use to promote the industry, but um, I can tell you that this is the fourth economic study that I've been involved with since I joined the organization in 2012. We've always grown. We haven't always grown this big. We have a tendency to grow this big every, two, every four years. Uh, and so what you're seeing now is uh, similar to what happened in 2015, which was a big growth. 2017 was very, very minor growth. 2013 was minor growth. So uh, I would say that at two years from now, 2021, I can only guess and look at the, the trends and say maybe we'll have minor growth. That said, with streaming and Stadia and you know, uh, Xbox's streaming service and just the fact that our industry has gone from 100 billion in global revenues two years ago to 150 this year, there is an insatiable demand for our products, which would require an insatiable demand for talent and development. So I would only assume that if, as long as our industry keeps producing things that people want to play, so long as our industry keeps giving people experiences that excite them, then people are going to buy our products and we're going to need more employees to make new and even more exciting products to, to blow their minds even more. So.